Okay, so our next speaker is Alan. He's going to be uh, presenting um, his experience using the uh, model that they use for assessments for the uh, Halibut Commission. All right, thanks everybody, and thanks again to the organizers of this workshop. All of these CAPMs have been excellent, and um, the International Pacific Halibut Commission has certainly benefited from these workshops in the past. So today I just want to talk about sort of the needs at the International Pacific Halibut Commission or IPHC and what we may need from a generalized stock assessment um, framework. And so before I do that, I think I'll be one of the few that actually shows pictures of the species we work on. Jimmer yesterday had a few pictures as well. Um, <clears throat> well, there's, there's a halibut in there and then there's something else. I don't know what that other species is. Maybe it's Homo pepsians or whatever, I guess. Um, <laughs> But how Pacific halibut get very large, or they might not get very large, which is pretty interesting, but they live a, a relatively long time, um, and they're really fun to assess and um, to collect data on, and really good to eat as well. They move around a lot um, along the coast, and um, they have variable dynamics. So the IPHC, or the International Pacific Halibut Commission, is really operated under a, a convention, a convention for the preservation of the halibut fishery, which is a really interesting title, that we're preserving the halibut fishery. Um, but it, it works well. It was actually the first uh, international agreement uh, between two countries for uh, a marine fishery, and that was in 1923. Um, we've had many commissioners. These are some of the first commissioners there, as well as um, over our almost 100 year history, but we've only had seven directors over that 100 years of which William Thompson was the first. Our convention area um, ranges from California up through British Columbia, around through Alaska and into the Bering Sea. Um, uh, that's the area that we are responsible for, but it's not the entire area um, of the range of Pacific halibut, which come around through Russia and Japan, actually. So it's, it's a large area and involves two countries. <clears throat> uh, the fishing mortality has been variable over time, um, but you see that fishing mortality uh, was quite high in the uh, early 1900s and before the treaty was actually signed and, and the commission was formed. Um, there are times when the mortality dropped to low levels and times when it was high, and that wasn't necessarily due to fishing. There's natural fluctuation in the population, and uh, Pierre Carpi will talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. <clears throat> so on to the fun stuff, stock assessment. Uh, really interesting history of stock assessment at IPHC, and if you have a chance, read a paper by Bill Clark called A Model for the World in 2003. And he basically put together these, these eras, um, which I think Eric sort of referred to the golden, golden age there. Um, but he defined the Renaissance era, you know, developing these methods, these production models, you know, per recruit types analysis into this golden age of Cajun, um, <clears throat> which you hear every once in a while it comes up, but maybe that's just because I work for the Halibut Commission. Um, the modern age, when we started doing statistical catch analysis and fixed M, right? Um, and then the postmodern age um, kept moving that forward, still using statistical catch analysis. And then our current um, era, which is currently unnamed, I'm not sure what that might be in the future, but this is where we're advancing the, the, the methods into more ensemble type modeling, um, doing risk analysis rather than specific catch advice and other things like that. So I mentioned ensemble modeling and we actually do um, that, we take that approach in the assessment at IPHC where we combine, uh, we use four different individual stock assessment models, all coded in um, SS, not coded, but um, implemented through stock synthesis. And um, we ignore growth altogether because it's just too hard to model for Pacific halibut. It changes so much. So we just use empirical weighted age approach. We, we have the observations of weight at age. We can do that because we age about 30,000 halibut every year. Um, and that's four readers. Um, <clears throat> they stay pretty busy. We also link um, average recruitment to the environment. There's a linkage there that's been done for years and it's actually remained consistent. Um, so that's pretty amazing in, its, in itself. But these four models are then integrated 
into a single model, a single stock assessment model that has structural as well as parameter uncertainty. Um, and that's passed on to the commission in the form of um, decision tables. And this decision table is basically their look at the risk of stock doing different things under certain catch levels. So if you look at the top, there's the benefits, um, that's different catch levels. And then down the rows would be the risk or the tables filled in with the risk. And I'll show you an example of this, where now the um, decision table on the top has different catch levels, mortalities from the left being low catch and on the right being high catch with different risk of different events happening, which are displayed by the rows. So for example, that top row is the spawning biomass in 2020 is less than it is in 2019. And this is the risk of that happening over the different catch levels. So it's really important for us to characterize uncertainty in this stock, to have a full characterization of it, to be able to calculate all of these um, different risks at different catch levels. So that's a really brief um, overview of the stock assessment at IPHC. And in fact, Dr. Ian Stewart today is frantically working on getting that done. Um, he got the data, I think, yesterday, and now he has to get the stock assessment done within three weeks, which for some people that might seem like a long time. Um, <clears throat> but we're also working on management strategy evaluation at the IPHC. And I noticed Andre copied my figure earlier today. <laughs> but um, it's it, management strategy evaluation. We've been embarking on this process for a number of years now at IPHC, and we've gone through many of these boxes, and we're actually hoping to get to the application phase of this in 2021. So I'm under a lot of pressure to um, get this done, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to have to deliver results to the commission in 2021 um, and then continue the process. But we basically, if you notice that stock assessments done on a coast wide level where it's um, providing uh, advice on a catch level on a coast wide level, but you notice all those different regulatory areas throughout our convention area. And what we have to do is we have um, advice on a total mortality coast wide and then we have to distribute that to the different regulatory areas. So we think of our management procedure our harvest strategy as two different concepts, the coast wide scale concept and then the distribution procedures um, part of it. And so I mentioned that because we decided in our MSE to take a first look at just the simpler part of that, the coastwide part of that. And we've actually completed uh, MSE um, just looking at the coastwide scale, ignoring the distribution part, which is really what's of interest to a stakeholder that has quota in a single area. But um, this was a way to make progress in this um, long, complicated process. So what we've done is we actually use stock synthesis as the operating model, but not the exact um, configuration that's used as the assessment. So according to what Andre said earlier, we did make a lot of, um, what do you call them, deadly sins, I think it was. Yeah, we, we made a few deadly sins in doing this, but it was a really good way to show the stakeholders an example of what MSE is. So it was very useful in that context. Um, but basically, it was our wrapper around stock synthesis, calling, using a lot of functions to call stock synthesis, look at output, create input files, and do all these different things. So it was a little bit cumbersome, um, and it really is not generalized, unfortunately. So we came across a lot of challenges like conditioning the operating model when it's not the same as the stock assessment. I wanted to open up new parameters to get uncertainty in that, but we don't have data to inform that. So how do you do that when a stock assessment's developed for the data that you have? Um, and then you open up something new and it just causes a bunch of problems or errors or non-convergence, whatever you wanna call it. So we had some challenges there um, and a lot of other little things, accessing the right quantities and access to certain things, but really it was speed that was the real limiter in that the, the, the way that I designed this, it wasn't really optimized for speed. Um, and so simulation times were long and we had to make a few other deadly sins to shorten those simulation times. So with that being said, we have the opportunity now to continue this work. And this is really our future, which is looking bright. Um, and we are now embarking on developing our own operating model at the IPHC. Um, and the reason we're developing our own instead of um, 
working and collaborating on develop a generalized model is, as I said, our time frame is 2021. We have about a year to do this. So we have to do it quite quickly. So we thought, let's do this now, get this done. Um, and then we have something out there that might be able to be used by others or contribute to the process of developing a generalized model. Um, a few things that we're putting into this is parallelization, I think is what it's called, Andre, is that right? Yeah, yeah something like that. <clears throat> yeah, um, uh, we have dynamic reference points are really important to us given the changes in productivity that Halibut have. So we're, we're advancing a, a few things, but we're really interested in being here and working with everybody on advancing these concepts. And this brought us to thinking, something that I've been thinking about recently at least, is this continuum of fisheries models. We have fishery models that we develop for conceptual understandings, you know, life history models and all those things we're doing to just understand the biology of the species. And there's this continuum between all of these, and this was in an FA report, FAO report um, and cited by a few others so, um, after that. But we have um, more types of strategic models like MSE, and those are developed a little bit different than say our tactical models that are really looking at making tactical short-term decisions like an assessment would do. And so we had a thought here, you know, one thing I've been thinking about is it's really important to define the scope. And this is what we've learned in our initial development of our model right now, is we really needed to define the scope of what we wanted this model to do to, to make the design process go a lot easier. So something to just think about. So that brings me to the um, real, uh, the title of the talk is what, what are our sort of our needs at IPHC? What are things we're looking that we do now and what are the things that we're looking to do in the future? And so this is just a real quick summary of some of the things. Um, we really would need a flexible framework for examining uncertainties, um, you know, structural uncertainties as well as incorporating things into an ensemble, but we also um, need to incorporate things such as time varying aspects and changes in um, different parameters, selectivity, data collection schemes, etc. We are um, very interested in advancing the science and using modern options, um, data weighting options. We had the Kaplan workshop a few years ago on that. Um, functional forms, but you know, really important things are maintaining the ability to link to the environment. Um, and then things like that really haven't been done, at least in stock synthesis, are joint priors, prior between H and M, for example. That's pretty important. Um, and, and developing custom priors, maybe you, you elicit information from professionals or experts and come up with some weird shape prior, that might be helpful. Um, and then custom likelihoods with temporal covariance, some, uh, covariance, something we've been talking to Jimmy and Ellie about. If you have these spatial, temp temporal spatial models, you might incorporate that into your likelihood some way. Um, reference points, I'm not gonna go too deep into this because Pierre Carpi is gonna talk about this, I think tomorrow. But we need the ability to have static as well as dynamic reference points. And there's a number of ways that dynamic reference points can be viewed. Um, and that's what I'll say about that. But there's some more work to be done in that. <clears throat> um, estimates of uncertainty. This is really important. Um, as you saw, we develop risk tables. So we need those um, estimates of uncertainty, not only in the parameters and the derived quantities like spawning biomass, but we need the covariance between some of those things. Developing some of these risk tables, like what is the um, probability that the spawning biomass next year is greater than it was in this year, you need to incorporate the covariance between a lot of those parameters to calculate those performance metrics. Um, and we've had challenges with some parameters. We've had to assume what covariance might be. So really paying attention to what the covariance matrix and what parameters have uncertainty around them is important to us. Um, and then incorporating multiple methods to calculate the variance, whether that's MTMC or bootstrapping or all these sort of things, just so you can examine the difference between them at least. And MCMC, you know, uh, we've tried to do MCMC at the Halibut Commission, and I, I don't think Dr. Stewart, Ian, Ian Stewart was as patient as Jemery say. Um, he probably gave up after three weeks. Although I do know Ian Stewart 
for a paper he did on um, sablefish, he ran, he went on vacation for like two months and he started an MCMC and came back and it was done. Uh, nice. <laughs> um, so, so that worked out, but we haven't been able to do that at the Halibut Commission, even after having Cole Monahan um, program in some really complex stuff and, and speeding up the process. There's hope in that and what Cole Monahan's done. But um, we think that should be carried forward in the generalized framework and in, in these new methods of MCMC and sort of integrating those and being able to calculate those uh, chains, at least in efficient, in efficient manners. And then having access to the covariance matrix. If you've ever talked to Cole Monahan about accessing the covariance matrix in, in ADMB, um, just be prepared to be confused. Simulation in the framework would be really useful, um, not only because my interest is MSE and having that closed loop feedback, but also being able to just test your assessment model and see how well it's um, performing. I think as Andre said earlier, if your model doesn't perform well under simulation, it's probably not going to do well with real data. So having those simulation um, aspects, even to explore alternative hypotheses is, is really useful. And uh, so then expansion, this is one that I'm really interested in, is being able to add options into, um, into your model, whether that's through flipping switches in an input file or being able to write some code that's linked into the um, actual executable in some way, whether that's through a dynamic approach or um, you, you have a really quick turnaround with developers. But being able to add in the options um, quickly, I think, is really important to us because we're, the, the science is advancing all the time. And as, as was mentioned earlier, um, people are saying if only stock synthesis could do this or if only my model could do this. So um, if it can be done quickly, then I think that would be really useful. Standardized outputs, really important, um, not only for linking to um, or comparing with other models or in your review process or creating for reports, but we need these formatted and standardized outputs. And it would be nice to actually be able to tell the model what outputs you would like. Um, you don't want it to develop these huge files with every single output known, you know, with uh, eight dimensional arrays displayed in some way, but um, we need some sort of standardized output and be able to get what we need for all the different things. Saying that, it would also be nice to have a brief summary file or something that you could quickly look at when you run a new model um, and just have a really quick overview. Um, I know R4SS, and I, and I, um, I repeat the, the accolades for that, it's, it's a fantastic um, external tool to use with stock synthesis, but sometimes reading in the files and maybe I don't know how to do it, it can take a little bit of time, but, and I'm a guy that likes to just look into the files. So maybe a brief summary file would be really nice as well. And then finally, external software like R4SS is really useful to have for this. Um, something that can easily link. And as uh, Andre mentioned this morning, something that can compare or, or link and produce similar diagnostics or outputs for multiple different types of models. Um, that has, if anybody's used stock uh, synthesis, you've used R4SS, I imagine, as well, and you've realized the importance of that. Um, and I think Ian Taylor mentioned one time R4SS now has more lines of code than stock synthesis. Is that true, Ian? It's, yeah, no, excellent. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, um, and, and the other thing, you know, is just producing these standardized outputs. It helps with our review process. Um, it helps people understand your model and, it, and it, it really helps collaboration as well. Saying that there's a balance between what can be done inside, you know, what should be done inside the general framework and what should be kept outside. Um, as Andre mentioned earlier, maybe ensemble integration should be kept outside of a general framework, which, which makes sense to me. And we actually developed a package called Ensemble, which can take SS models and integrate them using the variance covariance matrix. So in summary, generalized model is very useful at IPHC. We're very interested in, um, in, in a generalized model and keeping to use a generalized model for not only our stock assessment, but for our MSE process and as well as simulation um, things that we do there. We like that it, there are models that are accepted, have been peer reviewed. It helps with our review process. Um, other agencies can understand what we're doing a bit easier. We can talk to them a bit easier. 
Um, we can configure them easily for the, the ensemble or the in examination of different structural uncertainty. But um, really the key here is that IPHC is interested in collaboration and, and the IPHC um, is willing to help out in the development of these generalized models and however that we can, which is why we're here at CAPM. So with that being done, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Um, any questions? Oh, Andre. Yeah, nice talk. Um, I had a question going right back. I mean, I, I think I agree with all the generic suggestions. I think they're, they're great. Going back to your MSC, and you had, you said there was speed issues, and there are three places where speed comes into an MSC. One is just conditioning the operating model, which you do once. Yeah. Oh, well, you hope you do once, you may yeah. do. <laughs> then there is the estimation model, which is usually where most of the energy is. Mm -hmm. And then there is the operating model itself. Yeah. Um, and you, in, in my experience, the time to, the, the speed of the operating model should not be the problem because you want a complicated operating model. Mm -hmm. But I was intrigued when you said the speed, which, which of those variables, which, which of those areas was the problem and how do you see a general model solving it? Yeah, great question, Andre. And actually I, I used an R profiler to look at my code um, and examine where the speed issues were. And in some cases it was just the fact that I didn't write efficient R code. But in general, using stock synthesis as the operating model, and maybe I could have found a better way to do it. But what I find is that speed is highly degraded when you start writing and reading input file, input and output files. And um, I'm the kind of guy who wants everything. And so I was keeping reports really long. And I think the input and output of those files was really what was causing it. And the reason that I was doing that is, after I do these simulations, I might take two or three weeks. I might go back a year later and want to just look at some other performance metric in there. So I didn't want to lose that information, but the, the speed was the issue. And then calling stock synthesis on, on every round uh, or every year after a management procedure was applied. Um, so that's something that I'm still thinking about, but, but I think being cognizant of where the, um, using like profilers and things like that to understand where these models have the speed issues and then being able to um, specify options that may write out less data or something like that and can actually speed up the process um, would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, I, I imagine, yeah. So for the reading and writing, wouldn't a solid state drive make that really quick I, so it wouldn't be a problem? It, it, it's definitely improved it but there's a lot of overhead. And, and I think too, yeah, you're thinking about it, it, it's also in the calculation of various metrics within the generalized model. You know, doing your equilibrium calculations can take a long time, searching over different Fs and things like that. And so I didn't actually profile stock synthesis, but I profiled my code in R, realizing that that was really the, the limiter, that, um, you know, just having those options of what, um, what calculations are done and how you might be able to speed up those calculations would be helpful. Okay, any question? Yeah. Uh, I just had a comment um, and to tout, you know, Rick's responsiveness to issues and needs within SS that I'm gonna talk a little bit about in my talk is the need for quick, short summaries of your models rather than the full report file which is not a big internal calculation, but it does take time to write and read when you're doing simulation context that there's now an SS summary file, which is super abbreviated and has sped up a bunch of R code at the Northwest Center considerably. Mm -hmm. um, and now there's also options of how detailed your report file can be or right. to not write it at all. And so there's continued development there, but I think, you know, Rick could the development team is always open suggestions of how yeah. to speed things up. Yeah, thanks Chantel, that, that, that's really good to know. And, and I should have probably mentioned that development of this MSE code with the R wrapper was based on uh, SS 3.24. 
Um, and I, I just wasn't ready to switch over to 3.30. And I wanted, I, I realized that a lot of good things are coming out of the, the development. Um, and so, and, and then to um, echo that, that, you know, these summary files are great, but then you get into the problem of this person wants this type of summary file and that person wants that type of summary file. So perhaps that could be customizable in some way. Um, Ernesto? Yeah. Well, um, speed tends to be something a bit personal. What, what does it mean for you uh, being slow on this? I mean, if you're running a scenario, are you talking about what? Something that runs overnight, takes a week, two months? Um, on really fast computers with solid state drives, and I was doing a lot of stuff on the cloud, it was taken between three and six days. Um, yeah. And so that, and then, you know, when with our... Um, we have a board management strategy advisory board and of course they wanted lots of options. So, you know, you have a design and management procedures. It's all of a sudden a hundred things you have to do in three to six days. I, I had a lot of cloud computers that I, there's a lot of plates spinning in the air that I was trying not to drop, but um, yeah, that, that's it, a lot of time. It, um, it, it is, it is a, a lot of time, but yeah, I, I wouldn't expect something, you know, even a couple of days would be great. Um, I, I think that wasn't too well, bad. My, my measure of, uh, something workable is overnight. If it yeah. runs overnight, that's fine. Um, anyway, the one thing that we try to do is, is to avoid CSVs at all, avoid text mm -hmm. files at all. And, and one thing that speeds a lot of these things is to actually use a database and just dump everything, upload everything to a database somewhere. Yeah. And especially when you are using cloud computing, which means that you have things distributed across different computers physically. So that is yeah. a, a, a very good option to save time. Um, yeah. But my, my real question was about your ensemble, because in this case, your four models, they are actually giving you more or less the same results, just with slightly different scales. Did you ever come across a situation where actually each model was going on a completely different direction and you had to put them together? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And we're really fortunate at the Halibut Commission to have really good data and especially age data. Like I said, we. They, our lab ages 30,000 otoliths a year. So we have a lot of data. It's very good aging. Um, so we have a lot of information on that, um, it, at least in the recent time series. And that was the, um, just the last, I guess, 20 to 30 years of those models. Two of those models extend back in, I think, to 1888. And that's where you can really see the two models diverge, um, is in the historical representation of them. So, in, um, and then in the, um, we work on an annual process, we set limits or catch limits every year. Um, you, you might have noticed in some of the models, they were tending to go in a different direction at the very end of the time series. And those can have some you know, significant consequences to the catch limit advice and the projections, right? Um, so we do experience that, but with as good data that we have, we have a pretty good idea of where the stock is trending in recent years. So it's, it's not a big issue, but it's still that structural uncertainty that we do want to capture and, and get that idea. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I have one comment to make. So um, one of the things we do at the Turner Commission is we use the R for SS HTML files and we our assessments on the web. So when we have our meetings and our review panels and stuff, all of the diagnostics and outputs and everything are available. So our report doesn't have to be very big. So our report is just more of a summary report of the assessment. And if the you know, reviewers or anyone wants to look at the rest of the results, then it's easy for them to, to access. We also put the, the, um, the data in the control files and everything so people could run them themselves as well. Right. So it's like full transparency. And, yeah, but we don't actually have to make any effort to do it. You know, the, the, the website's yeah. already been programmed for us through R4SS, so it's yeah. really good. That, that is great, and that's direct, uh, definitely the direction IPHC is heading. Um, really, just 100% transparency, and we are moving. We recently redeveloped our website, and the plan is to put a lot of information on the website that's updated, and then keep the reports pretty small. So I, I definitely take a look at yours, Mark. Thanks for that. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Andre? Yeah, and I will probably defer to others, but one of the things about output files, so I developed a rock lobster model that was used in a couple of jurisdictions and essentially 
put some hooks in there that allowed users to write the their own customized output because that was just such a pain to try to generalize across all the jurisdictions. So yeah. the code, you couldn't fiddle with the model, but you could actually design your own, essentially report.sso file. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that was quite popular because the people got what they wanted and didn't want all the other crap. But um, I think there's people like John Feenster in the audience who may disagree with what I just said, but he lived through it. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I think some standardized output. So again, like you said, if your code has been reviewed in a, in a generalized concept, and you know that those outputs are correct, but I think having some customization would be would be really useful as well. Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Alan. All right. Thank you.